his impressive results on the generalized Poincaré conjecture impacted the, ma the mathematical world. Smell has received many honors for his work. In addition to the Fields medals, he was awarded the Veblen Prize for Geometry by the American Mathematical Society in 1966 for his contributions to various aspects of differential topology. He also received in 1996 the National Medal of Science for four decades of pioneering work on mathematics, on basic research questions, which have led to major advances. In addition, Smale has been awarded the Chauvinet Prize by the Mathematical Association of America in 1988 for his paper on the efficiency of algorithms in analysis. In the following year, he was awarded the von Neumann Award by the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Then in 2007, he was honored with the, with the award of the Wolf Prize for his groundbreaking contributions that have played a fundamental role in shaping differential topology, dynamical systems, mathematical economics, and other subjects in mathematics. Now we have to, the pleasure to announce his talk on the mathematical foundations for the new sciences passing from physics to bi biology and Google. Please, Steve. Thank, thanks very much, Cesar. I guess uh, this is working and everybody can hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be back at IMPA after so many times, still a pleasure uh, to speak here again. Okay, so uh, today uh, I want to talk something about these uh, new sciences. Uh, so what I, do I mean by that? Well, there's a lot of new sciences, but i give three examples. One is uh, biology. Of course, biology is not new. So I just say what I mean a little more specifically since the double helix. So that's, that's pretty new. Uh, another uh, science uh, I'm thinking of uh, especially is vision. In a broad sense, uh, which includes uh, pattern recognition, image processing, uh, studies of the uh, vision in the brain or are, are doing algorithms for artificial vision. Another one uh, is Google. You know, that classification of documents. How does Google work? So that's a new science in this list. Okay, uh, so so I'm looking for what I suggest we do is look for some kind of mathematical foundations of these subjects which do not exist really uh, in any serious sense of the word. The mathematical foundations really aren't there. So uh, this is a suggestion. We try to find mathematical foundations like there is for uh, physics. Physics has good mathematical foundations from... Newton, uh, Newton especially, in classical mechanics, uh, and many people, especially von Neumann, in quantum mechanics, and so on. So physics does have good foundations. These subjects, the new ones, don't. So uh, I'm suggesting, then, that we look for such foundations. And I want to make some more specific suggestions as we proceed, but it might be good to look at the uh, situation for physics and see uh, what is there and what we might learn from that. So in physics, which is a good model for foundations, we have uh, differential equations. This is certainly a major part. These are uh, very well posed mathematically in many cases, most cases, and uh, 
They certainly are part of the foundations of physics. And we could say on the space is geometry, too. So on uh, manifolds or Euclidean spaces. So here we have Riemannian, geometry, Euclidean, which goes back, way back. So uh, there are these geomet uh, geometries uh, as well as the differential equations. And I would suggest maybe that uh, this new era has seen a diminished role of differential equations, even in physics, but differential equations suffer a lot because they aren't exactly uh, set up to deal with these, these subjects. Somewhat in biology, we have a subject called mathematical biology, and that's mostly based on differential equations. Uh, but I, t I take some exception about the role of mathematical biology in biology. I think mathematical biology is a little behind the times because uh, <laughs> the trouble is that uh, mathematical, the differential equations suffer two things that you know about here very well, chaos <coughs> and complexity. Well, we suffer most places because of these things. Chaos says that we, you know, there are strong limits to the predictability of solutions in very complicated situations. Complexity says that the running time uh, of solving the differential equations gets too enormous too fast. In biology, a protein has uh, <coughs> the number of molecules. The number of atoms in a protein molecule is something like 10, typically 10,000. And all these bonds and so on are so complicated that to try to do differential equations in many, many settings in biology is uh, not really possible. So these are barriers to, uh, to using, using differential equations. And what about the... Uh, these geometries, geometries, Euclidean, Riemannian, um, Minkowski, <coughs> etc. Well, the manifolds uh, are not very apparent in these subjects. We don't see manifolds. We uh, see oftentimes uh, subjects dominated by finite spaces. Finite space is a manifold, but in a manifold in a, such a superficial way, I don't hardly count that. So these are the things that we want to see how to uh, deal with in this, this kind of setting. Okay? And so uh, towards that end, let me give, uh, this is, it's not exactly a full detour, but a little bit of a detour on how uh, we did s deal with these things uh, in the general setting. This is especially uh, work with my son, Nat. So Nat Smail. And, uh, and uh, the main paper we did was joint with us, and we were joined uh, by Bertoldi. You can find this. Just published Bertoldi and Schick, Thomas Schick. So this is Hodge theory. On metric on metric spaces. Yeah. Some you know this is a good approximation of the name. So here we take some of the classic notions of uh, differential equations. The Hodge equation is a differential equation on a Riemannian manifold. And uh, what we do uh, in this work is to extend that in a, reason I'll tr in a way I'll try to make it a little more precise uh, to uh, situations which could cover uh, these subjects. 
in, in particular for finite spaces. So this Hodge theory works fine on finite sets equipped with minimal structure, namely just metric spaces, possibly a uh, uh, probability measure. Okay, so uh, let me just show how that goes. And what that does, uh, by the way, and maybe one of the most important, important things it does is allow one to look at homology groups, Betty numbers, on finite spaces. We have to say what that means so it doesn't, so it doesn't become trivial. And in fact, uh, I'll talk about this maybe a little bit later in the series of talks. If you look at a certain set of about 800 uh, genes or variants of genes called alleles, gene, var gene variants, uh, yeah, since the, the helix, this subject is dominated by uh, questions of genes, DNA and uh, the representations of uh, proteins and so on. Okay, so one can look at these spaces of uh, size around 800. These are gene variants which are called MHC. We don't have to worry what that means now, but these are about half of the gene, gene variants which are related to the immune system. These are the genetic structures uh, telling us about how the immune system works, how uh, the body fights diseases, how vaccines could help the body fight diseases, such things as that. So here we have a, a set of uh, 800 points. This, this is discrete. And I mention this because this is not a huge set. So you don't have the, uh, there's not a huge data system operating here. It's this finite set of just 800 points. But it's big enough so that things are not uh, easy to work in the geometrical picture here. So what we're investigating uh, in this group that I'll talk about more in Hong Kong, uh, we've been investigating especially uh, what I would say scaled, homology of this space, let's call it uh, G of G at a certain scale alpha, say alpha scale. So I want to say a little bit now just how that can be made mathematically formal, that, that, that statement. So what we're investing, we're finding non-trivial, higher dimensional uh, homology in the space of gene invariance. I won't say it's a big deal, but it's a, usually higher homology has got some interest in, if it's done naturally. And this is a very natural way of uh, computing a, a hom non-trivial homology. And we're investigating now what it might mean, how to get our hands better on these, these cycles that generate the homology, such things as that. But the, it comes out of this alpha scale homology on a finite set. And that's what uh, is developed in this paper on Hodge theory. This is uh, the journal of FOCM. I think it came out last year. And so, yeah, it's not an easy paper, 50 page paper. Uh, a lot of hard questions, a lot of theorems that we had took a long time to prove. Uh, but, it's, but it's now, I think, in pretty good shape. Okay, so let me say a little bit about how to, how to develop this. And that will give something of a picture of the beginnings of a, possibly beginnings of a uh, mathematical foundations to deal with some of these issues. S sp spaces where you don't have the manifold structure could be, uh, they could be uh, infinite spaces, but even in physics, you have spaces that aren't manifolds, quantum field theory, and so on. And this gives some perspective on how that could be dealt with. Because here we don't have, we don't use, we don't assume a manifold structure, but just a compact metric space. So if you take a <coughs> X, 
compact metric. Could be finite. Uh, we have a scale alpha. The scale is going to be uh, something like uh, what distance you see things from. If you see uh, the whole picture from a long, long way away, then the scale is very, very large. Things look just like a, a point. If you look at it too close, then you just see uh, what happens at a point or in a small neighborhood of the point. So that's the scale. Scale ranges from close to zero to uh, close to infinity. The scale we always call alpha. OK, and so we have a measure. Mu, probability measure, maybe. Let's say, uh, anyway, a finite measure. And we want to uh, construct Hodge theory from that ingredients. So we will construct Hodge theory from this. So it's a very general setting for Hodge theory. It includes especially the situation of X, a finite set. Okay, so here is the construction. I'm going to be very brief, but try to make this sharp in some way. We take uh, U alpha, take U, U, let's say, K plus 1 power of, it's called K plus 1, the product. We're taking these product spaces, X, K-fold product. And we want to take a neighborhood of the diagonal and that product. So this product will contain the diagonal in K plus one dimensional uh, product space. And we want to take the neighborhood of that diagonal and use that to develop a Hodge theory. So it's this neighborhood of the di diagonal will have a localizing effect. OK, so uh, here we take. Delta, and this will all, all depend on that. X is fixed here. OK, so, uh, and we have a, a natural metric on here because this is has an induced metric because X is a metric space. And so this gets induced metric down here and gets an induced measure. OK, uh, now, then we do this for each K. And with just a, well, let me say uh, more precisely, what is the measure here? So we say, uh, use the, uh, the point x, distance x to diagonal is simply equal to the maximum of xi to the diagonal uh, in distance. This makes sense because it's a metric space. Xi is a point in this metric space. Uh, wait a second. I want to do uh, too, th too many things at once here. Here we have the maximum of over I. Yeah, this is OK. Uh, and here we take X belongs to UK plus 1. Or I can do it better by taking x belonging to x to the k plus 1. And now I think I have everything straightened out. So these are the i coordinates in this product space. And the distance of x to the diagonal just means we take the maximum distance uh, to the subset delta, uh, yes. So maybe I'm doing this too fast. So we could say to all p over p belonging to the delta here. And then eventually we minimize this distance over p. So this gives us a distance function uh, of points in this product space to the diagonal. And we take that neighborhood. OK, now uh, if I said all this correct, and I think I have, everything is all laid out in the paper, of course. This can be interpreted. Uh, we have alpha. Oh, yeah, I got to say that this be less than alpha, less than or equal alpha. I want 
points to be, you know, in the most na- naive, simple way, I want the points in the product space to be in this U space if they're with an alpha of the diagonal. So it's an alpha neighborhood of the diagonal. <coughs> okay, so this can be interpreted as a simplicial complex because you can check that uh, if something is in the space, then it will have uh, <coughs> sub pairs in the spaces for smaller k. So that gives this sequence of uh, the space over k as a simplicial complex. And so one can talk about uh, boundary operators, co-boundary, and all that immediately. So that's the sense in which we're going to be talking about uh, homology theory. <coughs> homology theory for this simple simplicial complex with a co-boundary I'll write down momentarily or a natural looking boundary operator. And these are exa- this is exactly interpreted as a simplicial complex because in the definition of a simplicial complex, the name th- main thing is that the size of the, of the uh, simplex also belongs to the complex. That's the key, key to part of the definition. <coughs> okay. Any questions? Could you explain, uh, make this what you mean, randomizing over P? You R- said randomizing. Not randomize. I take the, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah. So I don't want to randomize. This is uh, when I say over P. I'm taking. Uh, what do I mean here? X eyes. Uh, yeah. So, it, yeah. So I, maybe I should write it simply this way: the dis- distance uh, of X to P. Uh, let me just write the diagonal here. Maybe that's simpler because we know what the distance of a point to a set is. Okay, so this is the distance of the point X to the set diagonal. X is in the uh, k-fold uh, product, k plus one fold, and we demand that that be less than alpha. That's uh, that's. There's no max. Any max would go into the definition of a point to a set. So there's no more no more max, and this is uh, the condition that x belongs to u k plus one alpha. So, so th- this defines something that one would naively say that's the neighborhood of the diagonal. I don't want to do more than give it a naive definition of that. And the important property is that if you take UK alpha, UK minus one alpha, they also, we have the same thing going on, and the size of the simplex here are in this for smaller uh, K. The simplex is defined simply as a uh, X1 up to XK plus one. Belonging to U alpha K plus one, this is uh, this is a simplex, this k plus one tuple. Okay, uh, so this allows one, well, let me write down the uh, operator, just the spaces. So this is a, picks up the Hodge theory at the same time. So uh, here we have HK, uh, let me write function space, L2 of UK alpha gets mapped into L2. This is L2, ordinary L2 with respect to the measure mu induced on here. And here we get UK plus 1 alpha and so on. And I want to write here a co-boundary operator. This is the uh, operator, uh, standard co-boundary operator you see in algebraic topology books, it's called sometimes the Alexander Spanier co-boundary. It's defined on functions. I won't write it out. And now we can do the same thing with get an adjoint because these are uh, Hilbert spaces, so we can take this adjoint. 
And we can do this for any k to get this sequence. And now we can write the Hodge operator is defined equals co-boundary followed by co-boundary star plus co-boundary co-boundary star using again co-boundary co-boundary star here. So I didn't put all the indices here, but you can imagine what the indices should be. Okay, I think this is all straightened out now. Thanks for your questions. Okay, so the problem is, uh, what can one say about this? In the finite case, one has immediately a Hodge theory for this and the, and the cohomology, homology from uh, the groups I've described over here. So one has a Hodge theory, complete Hodge partition, Hodge decomposition of the space uh, using the uh, harmonic functions, which would be simply uh, those in the kernel of this operator. Okay, so this, some of this is not hard to prove. And in general, we need uh, these spaces HK alpha defined by, uh, this is co-boundary squared to zero, so we have these homology groups defined. So if these are finite in the general case, then uh, we have a Hodge theory. The finite dimensional group. So these are finite dimensional groups. <coughs> then we have a Hodge theory. That's, uh, again, not too hard to prove. Uh, but the problem is, when is this satisfied? So that's why our paper is so hard to read, because we prove in that paper that on the Riemannian case, this is true. But see, we've constructed a little different version of Hodge theory, uh, which generalizes to metric spaces. So comparing this with the classical Hodge theory uh, took uh, 50, 50 pages, you know, kind of a leisurely 50 pages. But it's, a, it's, it's pretty hard, and uh, we first had a mistake in it. Nat and I had some mistake in that, and eventually... Uh, Counter example was found by Schick. So the counter examples in the paper, and uh, all in all, uh, we finish up with this paper with four of us. But this is an example where you have some some kind of a, a good theory uh, which comes from uh, the manifold question, and now it works uh, even on finite spaces. Or even uh, the latest thing, Nat himself proved if you take uh, Alexandrov spaces with a condition on the curvature, then we have this finiteness condition. He proved that recently, and so that gives uh, a lot of singular spaces which will have a complete Hodge theory. Okay, uh, any questions on that? I'm just, this is just sort of an indication of uh, the kinds of things that could be useful, and I think will be useful, when going beyond the classical physics to deal with uh, these kind of questions in this new setting. Because here we are making so little assumptions on the spaces X. And Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all interpreted in terms of functions now. Uh, and you can, yeah, you can uh, interpret, for example, if you just take a sphere, uh, then uh, harmonic, so you look at the spheres or look at a set of finite set of points on here, then the somehow if you take these three cycles, or let's say a two sphere, you want this to be as, Essentially equal to the, uh, the uh, area, the uh, uh, area on the sphere. And if you do that, you construct the unique uh, harmonic uh, two cycle on this two sphere. It's a unique harmonic cycle using harmonic in terms of this operator. See, this is going to be a function now on the two sphere, on, on 
threefold product of the, uh, th- uh, threefold, threefold product of the two sphere with itself. That's what the elements of this uh, kernel will be, and they'll be those elements, and they'll be unique. There's a unique harmonic function in our sense on the uh, two sphere, which has this property: if you take three points that are close enough together in this neighborhood, the value will be the uh, the area. That's a little bit of a suggestion of what this means. Am I, am I right that in the finite case, these invariants will depend only on the number of points? Oh, no, no. That's not true. Oh, no, far, far, far from it. So are these the invariants of homomorphisms uh, or not? Uh, no. Uh, if you take homomorphisms which reduce distance, yes. Yeah, so it's, see, the metric has to play a role here. And if you take finite sets, take with a uniform uh, measure, then uh, the metric does play a big role. And, uh, you know, if the metric is, uh, yeah, the metric <laughs> does a lot. And uh, so, yeah, and there's an alpha parameter coming in. So if you take alpha very large, the homology is always trivial. If you take alpha very small, you get the uh, trivial in the sense that for each point has its own uh, homology uh, generator in dimension but zero. If you have two metric spaces with a new finite points, the same number of points, if yeah. they are Lipschitz equivalents. Oh, if they're Lipschitz equivalent, then they would have the same. Yeah, so in, in the finite case, it's, it's always... Oh, no. Lipschitz constant one. You need Lipschitz constant one. What I you mean, I mean Lipschitz. Huh? I, have, I mean just Lipschitz. Oh, no, that doesn't help. <laughs> Lipschitz constant one, yeah. Uh, distance to, uh, not increasing. Then you get nice theory, both ways and so on. But uh, otherwise, uh, of course, Lipschitz doesn't mean anything if you just, uh, yeah, so I don't mean uh, it's plain Lipschitz. Yeah, everything is Lipschitz, as you say. Yeah, so I guess just a little bit of the questions here. And uh, One conjecture I had, I uh, gave a lecture on this conjecture, and that, the was that on a compact metric space, these groups were always, uh, there's always finite, finite uh, dimensional, always finite dimensional. And eventually, somebody came up with a counterexample. And it's not, not trivial to find. The counterexample, uh, which is embedded in a bonic space of a compact metric space, which had the property that the uh, was infinite dimensional, maybe it was two-dimensional homology of the space. Infinite dimensional. It's an appendix in our paper, is this example. But it was hard to find. You know, I, asked, I was talking to some of the best topologists, University of Chicago, Shmuel Weinberger, and so on, and he, he had no idea how to do this. We thought about it for quite a while, but I started talking about the conjecture, and eventually uh, somebody found the counterexample. So these things uh, that I'm writing down, in general, are not so simple. They're not so simple. But, the, you know, the things are moving along, uh, you know, new papers, and, uh, and one can talk about now this homology of that space of uh, gene variants. Okay, and we're doing that. We're doing that in, uh, in Hong Kong. Okay, uh, let me then go more to our main... Geometry. I want to construct a geometry uh, that's suitable in these cases, all these cases I talked about. So it's a geometry on, uh, associated to these problems of vision, of Google, and uh, especially uh, immunology. So this is, has to do with the notion of a kernel. So it's a kernel geometry. And I think you know a lot of people who work in in these uh, modern areas uh, know about kernels pretty well, and maybe classical mathematicians less so. So let me just say what a kernel is: kernel on X. This this is independent of what I was saying over here. So this is a kernel on X, and it's uh, really the most important ingredient in what we've been doing in these. Uh, towards protein folding and uh, immunology. There was this kernel we constructed. We constructed a good kernel on the spaces of proteins. 
That's the idea. So I want to say what, what a kernel is first. And everything is, uh, the main cases we will be using are finite spaces. So these are going to be kernels on finite spaces. And that makes things easier to uh, define. So let's take x finite. Nothing else. Uh, often or usually we'll put on a, a measure, a probability measure. But for the moment, I just want to talk, what is a kernel on a finite, on a finite set? Okay, that will, uh, that will be our geometry. It's so stronger and more structured than a distance function. One could say, let's just take a metric space structure on X. But that doesn't have quite the fine properties that we need. So we want to make something finer than a distance function. A kernel which gives rise to a distance function, but has a little more structure to it. <laughs> so it's a map uh, K from X cross X into R. This is something we, the uh, Hodge theory, we won't be really be using later, but the kernel we'll use all the time, the notion of the kernel. A kernel, what is a kernel? It's nothing more than a positive definite matrix. That's the definition. So it's, it's going to give us a lot of stru structure, a huge amount of structure on these finite spaces. We have to eventually construct the kernel, construct positive definite matrices. And somebody, some of you may have noticed this doesn't really make sense. Because x is just a finite space, but if one orders x, makes an order on it, so one can take it. Uh, then from the order of basis, then we can write down K as a, as a matrix. And ask that that matrix be positive definite. If it's positive definite for one ordering, it will be positive definite for every ordering. So that allows us to use this definition. Okay, so that's a kernel. Nothing more nor less. And from the kernel, we have a uh, representation. It's called the feature map. This is a big role in the subject called learning theory, and a big role in uh, vision, and these other things, places too. In the, in the biology, people have used uh, kernels a lot. We're far from being the first to uh, use kernels. Feature map, uh, phi, given a kernel. Let's suppose we have a kernel on the space X that I've just given here. It's going to be a map from X into functions on X. And it will take X, a point, into simply K sub X. And we define uh, K sub X as a function on X. K sub X of Y is equal to KXY. And everything I'm doing now can be extended pretty easily to arbitrary dimension, any infinite spaces. But as I say, this definition is, uh, works a little simpler in the finite space case. Okay, so this is a feature map, and uh, now we can define a distance function, because now we can say the distance from x to y is equal to simply, uh, well, let's put a Hilbert space structure on here, the inner product space structure. So we say the inner product between uh, kx, ky equals K of X, Y. On, the, on a basis, K, X, this is a basis for the functions. It's finite dimensional. It's finite space. So the basis for the functions are these feature vectors. 
case of X. And we can define an inner product, or if you want a Hilbert structure, by simply this formula for every X and Y. Okay, so now we have a Hilbert space structure. Norm structure on this space is finite. And now we can say uh, the distance of x to y is simply equal to the norm kx minus ky. And one thing it could do to make this uh, perhaps more useful is we could take k tilde for any kernel of x, y. This is a normalization. And we call this the correlation normalization. That's k of x, y divided by k of x, x, k of y, y, square root. So we define a new kernel. This is a kernel easy to check positive definite matrix. And this indicates the correlation between these vectors. So this we call, we call the correlation kernel. And if we put the correlation kernel here, this makes a little more sense. So the distance is just this norm between these feature vectors using the, the normalization. Question? Yes, which norm are you using Oh, the only norm we have is given by this inner product. This is an inner product, right? Okay. So we use that. There's another, uh, if we have a probability measure, then we could talk about a second norm, like an L2 norm, which is sometimes uh, important. But the, uh, the simplicity of what I'm speaking of now, we don't have a probability measure on X. And uh, if you're not used to it, this may not look quite so simple, but uh, you have to get used to it. Uh, but, but all this can make sense because of the positive definite property of the matrix. That says that what we have here is really a, an inner product, and it's defined on all functions on X. It's an inner product, and uh, so this is a good distance. So this is the geometry. We have it now defined from the kernel a metric space structure on uh, our finite space. Given the kernel, that defines a metric space structure. And uh, uh, my uh, thesis is, instead of taking an arbitrary uh, distance here, starting with the distance here, we get something more with this feature map associated to the, uh, the kernel. So this gives us a more fine structure on functions functions on uh, finite spaces. Okay, <laughs> if you're not used to these things, it takes, certainly takes a while to digest what I just wrote on this. But uh, what I wrote here, I think, is pretty is solid. It's all solid. And, uh, there is a good background reference is where we... Uh, we do this all slowly and carefully in this paper on the title is something like this. On the mathematical foundations of immunology and amino acid sequences. This is, uh, I, I thought it was on my website, but Harold uh, pointed out it's not. But you can find this uh, easy enough by a Google search. It's, on, uh, it's in the archive and so on. So, so this is easy to find. And the authors are... Uh, Wenjun Shen, uh, uh, Chu and Wu Shao, uh, Raymond uh, Wong, 
One, two, three. Chin, Guo, and, and me. Okay, so uh, when I did it in uh, Hong Kong a couple of years ago, over a couple of years ago, uh, I put together a group uh, uh, working in the, the ma- mathematics of immunology. Uh, and it's been meeting uh, heavily. Nowadays we meet uh, for discussions uh, twice a week for an hour and a quarter at least. And uh, we finished this paper, uh, I think, maybe June. Uh, this was pa- finished. And this develops what I'm talking about now and what I'll be talking about in the, some in the next talks uh, to give uh, a good kernel. We, get a, we will get a a good kernel, one that represents the uh, medical, medicine and biology. And using that medical uh, the, uh, derived kernel uh, on our spaces of proteins and so on, we're able to get uh, predict uh, a main problem, it's a famous problem, the, uh, the peptide binding function. We predict that from the data. Uh, and it's a big subject in uh, immunology, a very big subject. And uh, our predictions were uh, state of the art. So uh, that's uh, and the, the p- people who were next to it, who had previously the best predictions, he, uh, he wrote me that his lab has confirmed our predictions, and they're, they're, he says it's uh, great. And the, ours are very simple, and they're based on this kernel that I'm going to be developing now. Okay, any questions about, about this? Any questions on this kernel? Does it have any meaning to consider the spectral measure that you get from the... Oh, yeah, but there's no, uh, there's no spectral measure. There's no, uh, there's no measure. Oh, 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 you want to take a... Uh, see, the measure I would take would just be, take the uniform measure on X. Then you, that, then you get a, uh, what I would call uh, you know, the uh, measure induced by the uh, integral operator, covariance operator. Yeah, so you can do that. Sure, if you have a measure, that, that would be the natural thing to do. Assume some kind of measure on the set X... Then you have this covariance matrix associated to it, uh, and that's important to study. There is another thing, also the conditioning. The condition of this problem. The condition of what? Of this matrix. It's a positive matrix. Yeah. Matrix. Oh, yeah, right. We talk about the condition. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I was wondering if there's a meaning for that. Uh, well, I think if you have a measure, then, uh, yeah, so I'm a little confused for the moment. Uh, if you need a measure for the uh, condition number, it's just a matrix, it's just a matrix right? Uh, I, I mean, you have to decide which in a product, perhaps. But, uh, yeah. But you have to find in a product anyway. Yeah, in the function space. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yes, yeah. So, uh, surely uh, the smallest eigenvalue in the condition and so on eventually plays a, a big role. Yeah. I'm just not sure at what point and where, where are you? See, we usually have a measure. Then I would want to look at the uh, associated covariance matrix with respect to that measure. And then you can talk about the smallest eigenvalue of that. Because I think somehow uh, this is a little too structuralist until you get something like that. See, if you use the inner product, you could be going in circles a little bit too. The inner products defined by K, to use that to talk about the condition of writing, I, I would worry about that. Okay, any more? Uh, yes? This, writing this kernel with a K hat, does, this, does it make sense to think that this gives you, might give you a notion of, say, a correlation? No, that's what it is. A correlation length? And yeah. That, and that sort of makes sense to associate with how nearly diagonal you can... Oh, absolutely. Are. That's exactly what it does. The we call this the correlation, we call that the correlation kernel. Yeah, but it gives you a notion of a correlation length, so how far can you start effectively correlate? Well, it, it, this is going to give you, uh, let me just give a heuristic picture here. 
So these, if these are positive, you're in this space here, kx, maybe up here, ky, kx. And now this is going to normalize things to go on this unit sphere, and then you talk about this cosine. Yeah, that's, that's an interpretation of this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so let me say a little bit uh, about this, this good kernel. So the good kernel uh, wants a uh, kernel we want to absorb the, na- uh, the na- nature into it. So far, uh, a kernel uh, that's going to be the main tie to the reality, to the medical uh, data, the medical information. It's the main tie in vision. It would be to the uh, you know the visual context and so on. So one wants to construct. K from the uh, the real world setting in which we're in, and uh, a good uh, reflection of the world, real world setting in this K, uh, we call that a good kernel. A kernel gives rise to a, uh, this distance function, so a correlation. So this oftentimes is called a similarity. A similarity measure. So a kernel, especially if it's normalized this way, gives a similarity between two uh, points, two, two functions. So yeah, so this is important to get a good one. That's a, you know some of the biggest problems in data analysis. All the data is in Euclidean space, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that, kernel, uh, that structure from Euclidean space is a uh, that much related to reality. So that's a big problem in data analysis. It's all done in Euclidean space, where Euclidean space is not necessarily the, the, best, uh, the best metric on the data. And so there's a limitation of what people do with data. And so, the, and so this doesn't go through Euclidean space. You could, because of this uh, feature representation, but we can also work just here to get a, a good kernel. And now what uh, we do is what I would say a hierarchical, higher, I can't even say it, high, I can't spell higher, arc, hierarchical, <laughs> hierarchical, something like this. <laughs> Hierarchical kernel. I just invented the word before I came to this talk. <laughs> okay. And uh, the idea of a hierarchical kernel is to uh, define it in terms of an architecture uh, of patches. So uh, in vision, there's an image on, on the screen here is a, a f- picture. You could first define this kernel as a similarity on the smallest units, maybe the pixels, or what we would say uh, sometimes, according to this Hubel weasel experiments in the brain, smallest units of which people see. So uh, we first define the kernel on here. And then we define the kernel, so that's what we call K1. Then we sweep this around in larger patches to get a kernel which will give similarities between two patches, uh, which would be invariant under translation. And that will give us a K2. And then we, on the whole space then, we put it all together to get K3. So this hierarchical kernel that we're defining here is something, uh, I think maybe for the fir- first way time this was done is in our paper here, where we de- define a kernel by the three-stage process. And then, especially the uh, real-world information is absorbed in the kernel at the smallest level. And then we do this kind of a, uh, extend that to these patches, intermediate patches, and then define it on the whole image uh, by, uh, well, by uh, aggregation, a kind of ag- a special kind of aggregation. Anyway, that's the main 
this is just an outline of the main steps in our paper here. The main steps are the construction of a kernel on uh, proteins, on peptides, amino acid chains, and this is K3. Then we take the hat over here, the normalization. So this is the, the main goal of our paper. And the main goal of our work now, where we're working on protein folding, is uh, following the same scheme, this three-stage kernel. And this is what I call hierarchical kernel. Okay, so, uh, yes, yeah, about an hour. Let me just give uh, an example. Let's give an example of Google. So Google, uh, historically, the subject of document uh, classification goes as follows. There's a, a, almost a caricature, but a good, you know, pretty good algorithm called bag of words. So in that case, we take a dictionary on words, which we could call K1. And so we, in this dictionary, we can put a, a matrix on the dictionary, K1, by using similarity of two words. If they're synonyms, then K1 would be close to one, or one. The K1 of a word with itself is always one, say. If they're synonyms, it's close to one. If they're completely independent of each other, then you would get a K1 of this pair of words, X, X prime, this would be uh, zero, say, if X and X prime are completely unrelated. So the kernel is going to be a, a matrix uh, of words with itself. So this gives you a, a kernel on the smallest elements. In the Google bag of words uh, algorithm, you look at the uh, words as the basic element. And now what one does is to, then if you have two documents, here's document one, document two, for each word uh, in the dictionary, so here we have a dictionary of X. For each word in the dictionary, what we do is we count the number of times in the document that word is appears. Same for here. So we get two uh, vectors, if you want, in a space with the same no dimension as the uh, number of words. And then we see how those two vectors are close or not to each other to get similarity for the documents. That way we get, so, so to speak, a kernel on the set of documents. And that will reflect how close this document is to this document. And so that's what Google does. And you you just go Google and search around. You, use, you want to get uh, documents grouped by similarity of the documents. So in this kind of a very simple case, that's what this does. And so what we do is a little more sophistication. This doesn't have any uh, intermediate stage. It goes directly from the dictionary kernel to the final kernel of the documents. And so what we're doing is we're going to put in things in between. We make this documents would be three. Uh, well, no, I'm hitting that. So now we're going to be looking at uh, intermediate stage like paragraphs. Between paragraphs, between documents and words. So we can do this hierarchy like this. And that's what we, you know, we can do. In fact, we were at the beginning of this uh, immunology work, we did have a good algorithm which did help classify documents and did pretty well using this, this hierarchical kernel. But then we got too absorbed in the immunology, so we didn't pursue that. But this is a, uh, a way of seeing what this hierarchical kernel does. It uses this, these intermediate stages to build a kernel starting with, first of all, a kernel on the smallest stage, and then extend that to the intermediate stage, and finally get a kernel on the full objects. Works that way. Yeah? Do you always use three-step uh, kernels, <laughs> or do you use, uh, like, uh, ten-step kernels? 
Uh, we also we, we used to use a lot of steps. Uh, you can take syllables or sentences. That's right, you could. Uh, but the, we have a sophisticated way of getting K3, which incorporates all that. So nowadays we're just taking three steps, and the intermediate size K2 is defined on all subsequences of all lengths or all sub uh, sub patches. So K2, K, we define K1 first. So this is the final version of, uh, not not this, but the final version of our kernel. Start with this on the uh, smallest unit. Extend this all at once to all the intermediate units by using a tensor product. And then we shuffle the intermediate units over the whole thing, back all around to get the similarities, and that gives us our K3. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but... It's sometimes uh, useless to do multiple steps uh, in terms of information that you could give you. Oh, yeah. Uh, about the structure of the kernels. <laughs> sometimes do you... Uh, does it happen a lot to have useful stuff... <clears throat> Useless steps. That's a you know that's a topic we spent almost a year of research on <laughs> things like that. To what extent? Uh, see this our construction, which I haven't got to yet by far. Uh, you know, can be pretty expensive because you're looking at all uh, all possible short subsequences. So it can be pretty expensive. But uh, and so maybe one could feel by getting out the most important subsequences. One could get it faster and more accurate. We never succeeded. We get it faster, but not more accurate. Uh, and the, in our problems, we have plenty of time, so we. Okay. we all, all of this, uh, this structure is inside this paper you just wrote on. This. Yeah, that's right. Well, it's there for the case of uh, amino acid chains, and I have a vision paper with Tommy Poggio a couple years early, earlier, which inspired this. And that had a version of a kernel there called the neural response kernel, where we needed, uh, we didn't stop at three like this. It was uh, more like uh, this picture here where you go stage uh, larger and larger. And that was used a lot in uh, pattern recognition. So, but what we had there was a mathematical uh, formal paper which did that. And uh, that was part of the inspiration which led me to look put this group together to work on uh, the amino acids, amino acid chains. Okay, so anyway, I think I've said a lot today. <laughs> so uh, if, any more questions? Uh, so I'll stop here. Thanks very much. Any further question? Okay, we thank the speaker again.